Tell me when, Val. Good evening, Hub Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Five Elements of Success Player Development Series. I'm Roger Nick, your host and founder of the Junior Golf Hub. Uh, we're coming to you here live at the Golf Performance Center. Uh, beautiful evening, if you can see over my shoulder here, uh, out on the uh, short course, uh, GPC National. So, uh, we've got a great show for you. As uh, last week we talked about ground forces and the primary fundamentals, we're going to continue on that and talk and show you more about the ground forces uh, with Dr. Scott Lynn as our guest and uh, our coaches here as always. Uh, we're really excited about the show uh, coming up this week. Uh, but before we get to that, just make sure that we get those comments, concerns in, uh, feedback, anything you can do to help us make this show better for you and help you become a better uh, golfer and, uh, and person out there as well. So please uh, send that feedback, the five elements at the Golf Performance Center, also YouTube chat, uh, any of the media um, outlets, please send it in. Let's get those uh, comments in uh, and uh, feedback. So thanks so much for that. Uh, also, want to also introduce uh, Tyler Campbell. Uh, he's our uh, director of performance here at the Golf Performance Center and co-host. And to my right, Dennis Hillman, a director of coaching and co-host as well. So we're excited about uh, this show. Like I said, uh, pop quiz this week. We've got a really good question. So mm -hmm. let me read that to you. What is the most efficient kinetic sequence? I'm going to repeat that for your chance to win a Great Cook R&T band. So you're going to need that after this show for sure. Uh, what is the most efficient kinetic sequence? And you'll probably have to stay tuned in to get that answer later on in the show. Okay, so we look forward to that. So Tyler, before we get into this week's show, let's talk sure. about a little bit of last week. Absolutely, Roger. So last week, guys, we had a great episode. Um, we reintroduced our primary fundamentals from back in one of our first few episodes. Um, and we really started to get into ground forces uh, and just kind of the surface level information there. We're going to get a little deeper into that today, as, as you mentioned. Uh, we were excited to have Dr. Brandt back on the show. Uh, he talked to us a lot about mental stability and how important that is uh, to helping us feel stable uh, physically as well. So um, looking forward to getting some, some more uh, depth today. Yeah, well, not only that, but just going through these changes in the off season, oh, sure. it can be mentally unstable as you're kind of getting frustrated as well. So that's a big part of Absolutely, this. So yep. again, uh, that was a great uh, show last week. We're going to continue this week talking about those uh, ground forces. And we actually have, uh, again, Dr. Scott Lynn uh, from Swing Catalyst showing us uh, and measuring and going through the analysis with some of our young players here and what it looks like and what those four ground forces are, those three things being the, the uh, horizontal force, torque, and also vertical. And that sequence is a really important sequence, so how important that is. So uh, looking forward to showing that video here shortly. But Dennis, as we're getting into the off season, we talk about you know preparing the young athletes for better development. Primary fundamental number one, ground forces, what are some of the things that you do with your young athletes? Yeah, I, I think one of the key places to start really is just at setup and, and based on the size and the frame of the junior athlete, uh, understanding how stance width is going to be a big part of really uh, determining how they move. Also, you know, understanding their function as Tyler will talk about just physically, you know, how they move uh, based on a physical assessment. So when you have those two uh, pieces of information, you can really understand uh, how they're leveraging the ground based on, you know, the different forces that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, some other things we do are body swings, just simply crossing your arms and going through a, a full range of motion of the golf swing and rotation and, and feeling where the pressure is in the ground and, uh, you know, are you keeping on the inside of the trail foot as you rotate back or are you getting to the outside and, uh, and, and go forward and see what that feels like in your footwork. Um, uh, split stance rotations is another key one, just feeling, uh, taking one foot and dropping it back and really putting all your weight on that lead foot 
and rotating back and forth and feeling how you, you leverage the ground to stabilize so that you can rotate your torso. Um, we'll use battle ropes, uh, which, which are in the gym. If you see people using, you know, with both arms up and down or alternating, we'll take that, actually grab it like a golf club, get a golf stance, and move it uh, side to side, kind of snake-like, back and forth, and feel how you, you use the ground to stabilize again and move uh, and put some force into that rope. Uh, last thing we'll do is we'll use an R&T band and, um, and, and we'll uh, put somebody into, uh, force them into the mistake, sorry. So uh, if there's a certain type of movement or tendency that we don't want to see, we'll actually uh, put the band around their body in a certain way and pull them into the mistake. Perhaps a sway, swaying to the outside of the foot, we'll actually try to pull them so that they actually have to do the work and turn in the right way and stay on the inside of the foot. So uh, those are some of the things we do uh, just to get started and, and understanding how to use the ground. Yeah, that's great. So with that being said, so before we get into uh, those things that you just talked about with the young athletes, we actually measure that. So our videos that we're going to show you right now is uh, Dr. Lynn, you know, talking about the ground forces from our swing CAD analysis that we did with some of our, uh, or actually a couple of our young athletes. So you'll see that and he'll have the explanation of what horizontal forces look like, what the torque forces look like, and then what the, the vertical torques look like. And they're all important in the golf swing. Everybody has a little bit of all of them. It's just a matter of the timing, the sequence of that, that actually is important to us. So uh, Val, if you would, just go ahead and uh, run that. Hey, here we are with Dr. Lynn talking about ground forces. Uh, as we talked about last week in the show, we've got more ground forces here. So now we're actually going to show you what it looks like. So Dr. Lynn, we've got uh, some young athletes here that we want to look at some comparison models on the swing catalyst. Uh, I think it's really interesting. You've got two athletes, a little different in their uh, skill level, if you will, but we see some similarities like club head speed, basically the same, but we're not seeing the same output. Can you identify some of those things that you see that may make that difference? And we're talking about horizontal forces right now. We'll get into the other segments later, but horizontal forces right now, and what do you see? Sure, so the horizontal forces are the side-to-side -side forces. So they're the ones that are gonna help move our body towards and away from the target, which, you know, a long time ago in golf instruction, that used to be considered like a, a death move in golf, right? A slide or a sway. Uh, but what we're finding is it's an important movement. Everybody has some of it. It's just the magnitude of it that depends on the golfer. Um, and so we have one player here, uh, a pretty good player on the side who's carrying on the right side, who's carrying the ball 246 with his driver. Another player here who's carrying it only 183. And so what we find is really important is, it's not really super important how fast our body moves, right? We've got to transfer that energy to the club. The club's the thing that's going to hit the ball. And so um, what we're finding with the horizontal forces is one thing that's really important is after you create that horizontal motion, you have to break it or stop it to transfer that energy to the club. And so you'll see here in the, the kind of less skilled player, he has quite a bit of horizontal force. Like the peak isn't very high, but it's on for a long time. So he's creating a lot of glide force or a lot of impulse there that's driving him towards the target. But if you look here, this is impact. And so a positive horizontal force means that this golfer is pushing down and away from the target and the ground is pushing him towards the target. So when you see a positive horizontal force, that basically means the golfer is trying to propel themselves that way and it's Newton or towards the target. And then Newton told us that if we're gonna propel us up towards the target, our feet need to be pushing away from the target. That's our action and reaction law. And so you can see for the basically the whole backswing, he's pushing in a way that his body is being transferred towards uh, the target. Um, and so what we see in really good players is eventually they're gonna put on the brakes and stop that from happening. But you'll see his brakes are over here. So if you take us to his brakes there, keep going. You'll see that his brakes don't actually turn on until after the ball is gone. So you see there, his brakes are turning on and the ball's already 40 yards down the fairway, or for him, maybe not quite 40 yards. <laughs> uh, but his ball's already down the fairway. And if we compare that now to a much better player on this side, you can see that his uh, horizontal force is a much steeper peak. So it's not kind of on forever. It has a much steeper up to a peak and then coming down. If you keep coming down, you'll see that he really decelerates a lot better. So that deceleration or that negative horizontal force or that braking force turns on um, before uh, the ball is hit. And so if I can start turning that on, that's going to start transferring that energy into the club and creating uh, a much more efficient golf swing. And so this is something that I've become super interested in lately because the most horizontal braking force that I've ever seen is in some of the fastest swingers that exist on this planet. So Kyle Berkshire, 
the current world long drive champion has the most that I've ever seen. And so I think this is super important. Um, how do we develop this? I mean, there's a lot of physical training we can do. There's golf swing technique changes we can do. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do to work on this. Um, but we do know every single golfer is going to need some horizontal push off and horizontal breaks. And the timing of when those things happen and the magnitude of when those things happen can be altered. And that's something you can work on at home. So Dr. Lynch, so that was great information for the horizontal forces. Now talking about doing some things at home for young athletes, what would be your two or three kind of exercises that you would see that could improve some of these horizontal forces? I mean, I, I just like lateral bounce. So if you just bound to one leg, break, and then bound back to the other leg, uh, and you'll find some people, if they have imbalances, I guarantee you that if you had this guy bound off his right leg to his left leg and he lands on his left leg, it would be kind of like, ooh, and he wouldn't be able to turn it around very well. And so being able to stick that landing and bounce back to the other side. And obviously, as you get better, you can get faster, more accelerations and breaking and turning around, jumping further, creating more momentum going each direction. So to me, just doing lateral bounce, sticking the landing and jumping back to the other side will help you identify where maybe your imbalances or your weaknesses are. And you can obviously progress that uh, as you get better at it. Awesome. And we're going to be talking more about that with Tyler Campbell, our director of performance here uh, later on in the show. So thanks so much. Now, we're going to be talking now torque forces, and that's what's happening also in the ground as we go through some of these young athletes. So if you could run us through some of the torque forces now and what that means and how that's represented here on the swing patterns. Sure. And so you'll see with torque forces, we have both athletes have a little negative blip in the backswing. And so this is where they're trying to create backswing rotations. And so if I think of a backswing rotation, my trail hip's gonna move away from the ball and my lead hip's gonna move towards the ball. And so that's how I turn in the backswing. And what we know from our action reaction forces is my feet have to push in the opposite direction of where I see my hips go. So if I see my trail hip move away from the ball in the backswing, my trail foot would have to have pushed towards the ball. And the opposite here, if my, my lead hip moves towards the ball, my lead foot would actually have to be pushing or pulling back away from the ball. So you have to have this kind of forward and backwards motion. And the analogy I always give to people is like a water bottle, right? If I had a water bottle and I'm trying to turn the cap off of it, I gotta push in one direction with my finger and the other direction with my thumb, and that creates twisting forces. And so your feet do that to the ground. Um, one thing that I found in my own swing, I get a little too lateral. I get too much side to side, and I wanted to introduce more rotation. And so one swing thought that really helped me was when I wanna take the club away, I tried to push my trail foot towards the ball. So I tried to slide my trail foot towards the ball, which limited me going this way and started to shove that hip backwards and create some, some torque force um, or rotational force. And so that's what this negative blip is in the backswing. And I think this is really good to get kind of a stretch shortening cycle going, right? Because you'll see some people that don't have a negative force and just go forward and they're not getting that preloading. Uh, so generally, the lower this gets, if your nervous system is, is able to do that stretch shortening cycle, the more you're going to get on the positive torque. Uh, the positive torque is going to be the one that's the opposite way. So now the positive torque, we're trying to spin our pelvis towards the target. And so my lead hip is going to go backwards. And so if my lead hip goes backwards or away from the ball, that means my lead foot is pushing towards the ball. My trail hip, what does it do in the downswing? It moves towards the ball. And so my trail foot has to pull away from it. So this is complicated information. I don't think you'd ever want to get over the ball you know, in your setup and think, okay, what do I got to do again? I push this foot towards and that foot away to the back swing. I put that one away now. Like you just confuse yourself. That's what Alex does, right? <laughs> you probably just confuse yourself and probably may not even be able to take the club away. But and and when people struggle to remember this information, I always tell people everyone's seen somebody's trail foot slip in their downswing, right? You've always seen it. It just happened to Greg Norman quite a bit. Have you ever seen anyone in the downswing of the trail foot do that and go right. towards the ball? Never does that, right? It always goes away from the ball. And so if you remember that the trail foot is sliding away from the ball in the downswing, then you can figure out all the rest of it. Yeah. Because it's kind of the opposite. But um, what we found through some of the testing we've done, some people use one foot more than the other, and that's what we call our leg dominance. Uh, and you can have a leg dominance for horizontal, you can have a leg dominance for torque, you can have a leg dominance for vertical. And knowing all those things about how your body works optimally is something that can help you identify if there are imbalances and you want to fix them in the gym, or if you want to play well today, Let's just make sure you use your legs the way that they're, you know, the, towards your strengths. Yeah. Um, and this is one force that um, I always tell people, I, I've yet to see somebody make this force go up off the ground and the ball start doing weird things. 
Um, I've seen more horizontal fours equal a worse golf swing, uh, less speed and you know less solid contact. I've seen more vertical fours equal less solid contact and less speed. I've yet to see more more torque equal worse things in terms of the club. And if you think of it, this is inherently a rotational game, right? We don't really physically move anywhere. I mean, there's a lot of people now creating vertical fours where they actually do jump off the ground, but inherently this is a rotational game. That's what most people will tell you, and so that's why I think this. This is such an essential force. Um, and you'll find less skilled players really struggle to get this near our tour average band here. And you can see you, you have some two pretty decent athletes here that can get this into the tour average band. And obviously two guys that have been working on this swing for a while. Um, this is the most complicated plane to work in. We talk about this in biomechanics quite a bit. We can move in three possible planes, right? The sagittal plane, which is the simplest plane. We move in it all the time. We walk, we run, we jump. We, all of those things are side to the plane motions. Frontal plane is the one we talked about, the horizontal force, side to side, and transverse plane is the rotational plane. And if you talk to a really good strength coach, they want to make sure you're strong in the side of the plane first, and then probably move in the frontal plane with slide board stuff, and the transverse plane would be the last one we work in. And so this is the most complicated plane for our bodies to understand how to move in. And so um, golf is, is not easy. It's a difficult sport. And I think this is partially why. And so really understanding how to use your legs to create rotation, how to the ground to create rotation is is uh, is going to be beneficial to a golf swing. Yeah, I, I think that's great information. As you say, it's very complicated. And it's one of the reasons why we talk about with our junior golfers and you out there is playing other sports and how important that is to get into that transverse plane as you start to you know incorporate kind of the neurological system, neuromuscular system. So that's really important there. So, I mean, great information. I think that's something that, you know, again, I'm going to go back what would you ask the, the young athletes to do? You know, maybe your one or two best exercises. You know, since they don't maybe have the swing cast at home. Yeah, I mean, I uh, one of the things I've been preaching for a little while, for a long time, actually, a really good training tool for for this type of feel is something called a Reebok core board. I know you guys have had some here. Yeah, we've got plenty of those, and and they don't make them anymore. Right? So there's, there are things that you got to get on eBay and try to find somebody selling their old thing um, because it resists that forward and backwards movement of your feet. Um, and so pushing your feet forward and backwards, a lot of people will, will explain this to you by putting a slide board under your foot where your foot just slips out, which is fine. I mean, it gives you that feeling, but it really what you want is a resistant. Like you don't want to be bicep curls by having something that shoots your elbow up, right? Like that's not using your yeah. bicep at all. Um, and so it's... It's resisted. So a Reebok core board, if you can find one of those on eBay, that's a really great way to train this twisting force. Um, I use a lot of reactive neuromuscular training, I call it. So I use like a club behind their thigh and I'll pull a band forward and they have to resist and push back. So we can show you some of that stuff. Um, or, I mean, if, if all else fails, I tell people to, to kind of do jumping 360s. So if you can get off the ground and spin 360 and land, um, you produce some kind of torque force. So you give yourself some angular momentum in the air. So. Um, so that would be the simplest, I would say, that can be done anywhere with anything. So try to just jump and spin around 180 to start with maybe, then try to do, you know, 720 or 360 or whatever it is, right? And Tony Hawk. Out. Yeah, let's totally. do some Tony Hawk. Sure. So try to do jumping rotations in the air. I mean, and obviously that has to be a combination of vertical and torque, so it's not just a single right. exercise. And that's where I think, you know, the Reebok core board really lets you incorporate it as, as a single force. Right. Um, but, and, and I think that that's a really great golf tool, which I don't know what they cost on eBay, you can maybe pick one up for in yeah. the hundreds maybe? Yeah, it's about 125 yeah. is what we see typically, so that, if you need one, we have one here at the Golf Performance Center. So. Right. <laughs> Perfect. And, and they're ones that, I mean, I would say hopefully it's at some company and maybe yeah. you guys might jump on that and start manufacturing them because I think yeah. they're, they're a really cool golf teaching tool that weren't invented for golf and I think I think Greg Cook was one of the originals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the first one who showed me one of those boards. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they're being made anymore, so that could be an opportunity for somebody to, yeah. to start to something like an idea. There you go. <laughs> right. Well, thanks for that information. We're going to move now, we're going to move into the vertical forces. So again, one of the uh, last parts of the sequence of creating force from the ground. So Dr. Lynn, let's talk about vertical forces now. And I think uh, a lot of young players we see, as we are just talking about before we filmed this, was how they were using that vertical force because maybe they don't have the stability you know, sure. as you know a lot of the older players would you know as far as develop. Yeah, and I think this this is the one of the forces that happens in the simplest plane, right? The sagittal plane. And this is why I think you, you give a little kid a golf club and a lot of times they'll just jump off the ground without you telling them how to do it, right? And so to me it's the simplest plane and, and this is one that 
I remember I was a junior golfer growing up in Canada. I used to go to golf clinics with all my buddies, and there would be golf teachers on the ground holding kids' feet on the ground. Like, they'd be <laughs> down on their hands and knees saying, no, we don't jump in this game. It's not basketball. And, yeah. and you know, I didn't know any better at the time, and I never was a jumper, so they never had to do that with me. But um, And I think it's because I grew up playing ice hockey, so I was a very lateral glider kind of a golfer. But um, And that's something that I don't know how, you know, Justin Thomas' dad was smart enough to say, no, cool, keep jumping. Yeah. Um, and I've talked to a lot of really smart golf pros that were like, hey, if Justin Thomas' dad went on the ground and held his foot on the ground, we, nobody would know who Justin Thomas is right now. Right. That's yeah. one of his primary ground reaction forces. Um, and so how was his dad smart enough to leave that in there? I don't, know. I don't know where that comes from or how that you know went into his brain, but that's that's really cool stuff, how people have that innate sense that, hey, let's, let's let him keep doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think me as a scientist, I like talking to those types of people and, and really starting to understand why that happens. So, and so we're learning a lot about that now. I mean, if you think back, I don't know, 20 years in the game of golf, how many people were jumping as they hit the ball? Zero, yeah. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Now we got, you know, Lex Thompson and Justin Thomas, and yeah. there's a lot of people that are literally coming off the ground as they hit the ball, Matt Wolf. Um, and so this is something we're learning a lot about, is this is a good way to create speed and power in a golf yeah. swing if you can, and it's not for everyone. As with anything, you can have too much of it, you can have not enough of it, you gotta find the just right for you. Right. Um, but this is literally something that you would work on your vertical jump. So just vertical jumping, the vertical, like maybe plyometric type things might help too. So landing, jumping, that kind of thing. Now you mentioned um, you know, leg dominance. Is this one of those things where understanding leg dominance would really help or it doesn't really matter? No, I think it does. I mean, cause that's where most, you know, traditional golf instruction is you load it to your right side on the backswing and then the downswing you get into your left side. And most people would assume, well, the vertical force happens later on in the swing. That's where we're using it off our left leg. And what we're finding is it's actually not the case. A lot of golfers are actually using both legs or maybe a little more right leg than the others to create vertical forces. So this is something that um, I know, you know, we have Matt Wolf swing on here and he actually does use quite a bit of trail leg push mm -hmm. to create that vertical force. And, and that might have been something that people would say, oh, that's like a reverse pivot, that's a hanging back, we don't want to yeah. do that. But now you're seeing, well, he still hits it unbelievably and has some of the most speed that we've ever measured on the PGA Tour. So I think we're starting to learn that human beings are different. And if we try to teach the same thing to every single person, we're, we're probably not going to do the optimal thing for them. And so, and I don't really know the answer yet whether, because a lot of you know the strength and conditioning research says, say I jump way better off my right than off my left, they would say, well, go to the gym and work on your left. Yeah. Um, I've done some work in ice hockey and one of the, um, I always tell the story about Andrew Cogliano who has one of the biggest imbalances I've ever seen in the vertical jump test. And I thought, oh, that's a big injury risk. And well, he's the Iron Man of hockey, right? He's played 800 straight games or whatever, never getting hurt. And so maybe there's something about imbalances in certain individuals that might work and might not work. I think there's right. so much we need to learn there. Um, and we haven't had this played around long enough where we could actually take somebody who maybe has a big imbalance and try to balance them out and see if better things happen in their swing or if it gets worse. I mean, we don't know a lot of those answers, but now right. we can actually measure it and figure it out. But Which is one of the things, like when you talk about the science of this, is it, why the individual is so important. It's its individual. Uh, and not because Matt Wolf does it or Jack Nicholas used to do it. Yep. It doesn't mean it's right for you. No. It's always different. Right? right. And that's where, you know, some kind of assessment on your body and how it's working right now, I think, or and how it's not working right now. So, and then that, that becomes a, a question to you is, do you want to play now or do you want to play well 10 years from now or five years from yeah. now or three years from now? And so, I mean, I think the golf instruction in the past has been based around, I want to play well now. Yeah. Right, we go for our hour lesson, we want to go out to the tee and beat our buddies an hour from now. Yeah. And our society is that. Right? <laughs> it's, it's the a quick fix. Yeah, yeah. it's the quick fix. And so, um, I mean, I think, and, and golf instruction will never get away from that. There's always going to be those guys who go to work all week and they take their Friday afternoon golf lesson and they want to play well with their buddies on Saturday. That's going to always be in this game. Yeah. Um, but if you're a kid, you know, going into high school and maybe looking to play college golf, now yeah. it's a whole different issue. Yeah. Right. We want to be able to play well five years from now when we show up. At, or I mean, obviously we have to play now to get to get recruited. So right. there's all these things that you have to kind of enter into your brain. And I think. This technology hasn't been around long enough for really track individuals over time. And that's why I'm really excited to work with you guys because I think this is our chance to, to really dig in there and see some of these yeah. you know, these changes over time as bodies change and, yeah. and people grow and, and you know stuff happens. It's, yeah. it's gonna be really interesting. Well, we're excited about it. And you kind of think about you know what's really happening 
in the golf swing. And you know, one of our mantras here is, you know, the, you know, how do you build the best golf forever? Mm-hmm. Well, it starts early, and it's not about you know golf skills early. It's about you know understanding these things early when it comes to developing an athlete and how that actually happens. So sure. I think that's you know, this is why we have these you know technologies here, swing catalysts, or you know, whether it's gears and things that we use is that, that measurement and understanding that so we can help perpetuate that overall long-term development versus this kind of quick fix you know, right. kind of mindset that we do tend to get into. And, sure. and obviously, as you said, it's gonna be part of the game. So you know, we understand that you're out there trying to play and, and wanna get better today, but understanding sometimes is getting better. Right. So it's just making sure that you understand what you are trying to do for you makes it uh, really important. So, uh, so Dr. Knight, thanks so much for kind of sharing. Uh, last thing on the vertical, one or two exercises that you would say these are these are things you have to do or you'd like to do. I mean, in the end, it's a it's vertical jumping. So yeah. so getting vertical, and I would say vertical jumping off one leg, off more right leg, off left leg, um, and I think you know combining a couple of the forces together may never be a bad idea. Like jumping, like we talked about jumping 360s or jumping 180s. Yeah. So you're adding the forces, like all the forces, or at least two of the forces in in one exercise is not a bad thing, but. Um, and to me, I think you know, I, I'm always a big proponent of unilateral exercise, doing things on one side and then the other side to, to identify imbalances and see, hey, well, I can jump great off my left and not so good off my right. I mean, this is something, as I said before, we don't really understand imbalances. I think it, it's almost too easy for me to say, oh, you have imbalance, you got to get it evil and then you'll be fine. Right. I think that's the easy answer, which we thought was a smart answer for a while. And I think that's something we need to start questioning just here. Yeah. Um, but still, I, I mean, I think. Vertical jumping is 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 you know a great. That's what this is really. That's what we're measuring here is, is how much you're vertical jumping and um, and it's not for everyone. That's the thing. I think like you know some people I've seen have tried to do the jumping thing. I, I just did some work with James Richard and uh, Francesco Molinari and yeah. he got into this jumping thing. I don't know if you remember at the Masters. Oh yeah, that little thing they got they caught on TV and, and he's like I think that hurt me doing that and I didn't play very well and so it's not for him um, but. You know, Adding that to Justin Thomas was probably you know key. So right. you have to be able, you have to kind of think about it. But um, everybody has some, and so yeah, if you're going, if you think that's for you, then yeah, vertical jump type training would be would be important. So, All right, Dr. Lynn, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and, uh, and and giving us a breakdown on these forces. Uh, again, number one thing for our primary fundamentals is having those ground forces. So uh, hopefully that's helped you. We're going to be talking further in the show with Tyler Campbell. Uh, on the physical attributes, you know, the function dictates form and what actually transpires to make these things happen better for you. All right, guys, so you saw that video there with Dr. Land. It was great information on those ground forces and what they all mean. Uh, I know that's a lot of information to take in, so hopefully rerun that a couple times, learn what that's all about, because that is so important in what you're trying to accomplish in the golf swing and uh, getting distance and also getting accuracy there as well. Uh, so understanding that and if you don't have something like this at home which i don't anticipate most people have a swing catalyst at home in the force plates uh, go find your nearest uh, pga professional maybe a uh, performance coach that has something that actually can help measure these things and i think it will help you understand kind of where you are in that leg dominance now if you're in a location that you can't find that i'll tell you find a great uh, trainer or coach out there that has the right information uh, I'll say I'll give a, a plug here for us, the Golf Performance Center. We got great coaches in Tyler Campbell and uh, Dennis Hillman who understand these ground forces quite well. Uh, give us a call, uh, give us some feedback there, and uh, we can help you uh, again uh, achieve your goals there with that. So, but Dennis, as we saw there with Dr. Lynn and understanding those ground forces, these young athletes, and obviously you coach these guys, and you, you've seen this quite often on the golf course, and why this thing, why it works, and why it doesn't work. Sure. Um, so. The one athlete there has a tremendous uh, speed and power, and you saw the braking mechanism he has sure. there. Uh, give us some things that you guys, again, talk about there. Yeah, so you know, I think it's really important to understand, uh, you know, we talked about kinetic sequence, there's also kinematic sequence, so uh, you know, the order in which your body is moving, changing direction, and also decelerating, which you know, Tyler, I think, will elaborate on the physical needs of, you know, required to decelerate really well. So, um, you know, I think a lot of it comes from working in the gym and just getting that ability to move properly uh, and, and not just kind of load up some energy, but actually deliver it and decelerate in the right way. So it requires really good footwork and, you know, uh, stability and deceleration of the lower body to, 
you know, transfer that energy to the club. Yeah, so, and you're working with these athletes, and I know we talk about this quite often, is what is their footwear like, you know? So they have to have, we talk about the equipment being one of our five elements of success. This is a big part of this, right? So again, if we're primary fundamental, ground force is number one, we gotta use the ground really well. So talk to us, yeah. uh, to us about the equipment. Yeah, I think it's really important, you know, again, we appreciate Dr. Scott Lynn uh, joining us and creating that video. And, you know, you really stress the importance of, of the torque. Uh, they're all important, but he said he hadn't really seen anybody uh, not be successful with good, you know, torque forces. And, and you have to leverage the ground. He mentioned the slide board, which we'll get our juniors on the slide board and, and take away any kind of traction with the ground. Uh, and then they realize how the, the feet are actually, you know, trying to leverage the ground. So. Uh, when you get back on the ground, you realize the right foot in the forward swing is actually, for a right-handed golfer, the trail foot is actually pushing backwards to rotate forwards. Uh, when you get back on the ground, you have that leverage, you realize how important it is, which means the golf shoes or the shoes that you're wearing are really important. So we want shoes that are stable but provide some mobility for the, for the feet to articulate in the right way, uh, particularly the trail foot and the forward swing. And you've got to have traction. So it's really important. So sneakers are not going to work. Um, it, not even just on wet grass, just, just in general on the ground, not having traction to leverage the ground uh, is it, just not going to work. Uh, even on tour, I mean, they still use the old spikes, believe it or not. They, they, uh, you know, we've been doing spikeless for a long time all over the world, but on tour, they, they know the importance of it and they have the old traditional spikes that go into the ground uh, and give them maximum leverage, so yeah. it's important. Uh, I, I think that's great advice there. Uh, and one of the things we were talking about too is just these young athletes you know, there's this idea that they need to be compared to these PGA Tour players or LPGA Tour players. Right. Uh, there's a uniqueness to this, this pattern in which we call ground forces. Um, so trying to get something out of you know, what they're doing is probably not the, the best thing that you can do. You really want to actually you know, try to work towards yeah. what your best is and not what someone else's best is, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's the old analogy of, you know, if you're, if you're in fifth grade, you should be doing fifth grade math and, and eventually you'll get to that higher level of math. So just to look at a tour player and see how they're moving, um, you know, not understanding where they are, you know, physically uh, and with their experience and their background and, and how they move. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to try to jump to that and just say, let me try to use the ground like that. Um, you know, I think you have to build the foundation the right way in the gym with well, Tyler. Well, yeah, Dennis, <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, one thing that you're seeing on tour now more than ever is how these, you know, professional golf athletes really started their athletic careers in other sports. And so when we're talking to a lot of our juniors here, we really encourage them to get involved in other sports, play basketball, uh, play hockey, you know, soccer, these sports that require the ability to change direction, um, jump. Uh, sprint. Uh, these are things that are all great for generating power in the golf swing. Um, and, you know, if that athletic foundation is laid at a young age, you can really take advantage of it as they go through adolescence. So, yeah, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Well, as you know, Tyler, being the physical side, you know, we talk about function dictates form and, and understanding, you know, what's happening in the golf swing. As you said, work, you know, playing these other sports, we see the, the action, you know, taking place in, in uh, you know, really in the transverse plane or, you know, sure. so there's so much going on there that's really important that they understand that, again, it has to fit them right. uh, and where they are. And obviously, you know, as we said about in the video there is we're trying to build the best golf forever. So we wouldn't build it off a model that says there's a limitation. It's we're trying to build a young athlete that can, right. you know, continue to, you know, build or compound, you know, his, his efforts, if no, you will. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, as we look at, we're throwing a lot of big words at you in this episode, transverse plane, we're talking about rotational athletes, um, you know, whether that be a snowboarder or, or a golfer, yeah. um, you know, and there are things that allow those athletes to really succeed. Um, when Dennis talked about uh, the ability to break or decelerate, slow down, Dr. Lynn was talking about that as well. That really requires a tremendous amount of stability um, in the lead leg in, in for us as golf athletes um, to you know be able to slow down the car if you will you know the last episode we talked about the Ferrari you've got this this sports car this high performance vehicle um, that can go very very fast but what happens when it doesn't have brakes that can handle the size engine that you've created so um, we are all about creating you know big engines fast powerful athletes here at GPC uh, at the right stage of development um, but what we've been working on all along is really putting those brakes together so that by the time they're able to get, you know, that ability to get that strength and power in their, uh, in their system, they can also control it and, and uh, hopefully stay healthy 
uh, throughout their career. Well, that helps ultimately with the kinetic sequence, right? right. And you're talking about that and how, you know, the neuromuscular system, sure. how important that is to this overall, you know, system, if you will. You know, talk a little bit about that uh, kinetic sequence, if you, yeah, you so, know, so how you work on that. You know, Dennis, there's two, two words, again, very close together, kinematics and then kinetics. Uh, kinetics is really just looking at the, you know, the, the forces that we're putting into the ground. Um, kinematics, in a sense, is looking at our description of our motion um, and, and kind of the, the sequencing of our hips firing, then our torso, our arms, and then the club. That would be what we would consider kinematic sequence. Kinetics, we want to really look at our ability to generate forces horizontally, rotationally, and then vertically. Um, if we do it in that sequence, and we know it's an efficient kinetic sequence, um, and, uh, you know, it, it's what we see in the, in the people who are hitting it the furthest. Again, it's not to say that everyone has the same kinetic sequence, um, but from an efficiency standpoint, that's the trend that we certainly, we certainly see. Yeah, and it's a good sequence. And, and again, you see that with better ball strikers, Dennis. And, sure. you know, as your young players are, you know, uh, developing, you, you go through different drills and feedback mechanisms. Yeah. So, so what are some of the things, maybe I don't have this tool at home. Again, what are some of the feedback tools that you use for yeah. you know, getting that feedback? Yeah, I think it's, you know, when you talk about the, the uh, you know, the kinetic sequence is really the same that you would see throwing a ball, hitting a tennis forehand, hitting a baseball, right? You're going to move in, in those sports and in, in all those other motions, you're actually moving, you know, one foot in that direction. Then you're rotating and, you know, perhaps leveraging the ground upwards uh, as you create all that force. So uh, we'll do something called a step drill. You actually can set up, you bring your lead foot next to your trail foot. Take your back swing and as you move forward, just like a baseball swing, basically you, you know, you replant your lead foot and you start to learn the proper sequence. So that, that's one of the really good ones to do. One exercise I really like in the gym that we work, we work with the, our athletes from, from a young age, setting, again, setting the foundation so that as, once, they, once they do get into high school and, and are ready to, to work on this exercise, uh, they're doing it safely, but the power clean or the hang clean. Um, you know, we'll work on those hip hinge mechanics and, and, and basically break that exercise down by steps over the course of um, really a few years, but uh, each academy year, it's at a minimum of four to five months of going through each step. Um, love the exercise because it, it, it allows us to be athletic, right? Allows us to generate force into the ground, understand that proper sequencing allows the bar to flow uh, kind of naturally through the motion. Um, it requires a tremendous, tremendous amount of speed uh, and coordination as well. So, uh, you know, again, this is something that takes a lot of coaching, takes a lot of feedback, isn't something that I would necessarily just go out and do um, uh, right out of the gate after a YouTube video or two. I would probably seek somebody, some professional help uh, before you try it, but we really feel that it benefits uh, our golf athletes here at GPC, for sure. Yeah, no, it's great. I tell you, this is a lot of, uh, uh, to, to digest, if you will. Speaking of digest, it's almost dinner time here on the <laughs> East Coast. So getting a little hungry, and uh, so I'm, I'm sure you guys are out there as well. But uh, again, you know, re rewind, look at this, look at the videos, see what you, you, know, you can understand, or, or make sure that you can understand all this information that we just gave you tonight, because it is the basis to everything you're doing, regardless of whether you're playing you know, golf or playing other sports, it, it will help you, I promise you that uh, for sure. Uh, but so again, thanks for tuning in and, and learning more about this uh, first uh, primary fundamental, which is the ground forces. So, you know, Dennis, any closing remarks as far as, you know, the ground forces? Uh, no, I think, you know, again, you know, get out there, play other sports, depending on your age, but I think, you know, playing other sports and, uh, and learning, you know, how to use the ground to sequence, um, it, it goes a long way. That, when you're witnessing that effortless power in, in some of these great players, it's, uh, there's a reason in their background uh, athletically why, why they move like that. Yeah, and they make it look easy, but uh, it's not <laughs> that easy. But, uh, uh, you know, Andrew, do we have any questions coming in? We do have a couple questions. Um, the first is about shoes. Um, do you recommend a different shoe for one you work out in versus one you play tournaments in? Or, you know, what's the different shoes you should have? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so, well, workout, yeah, I mean, definitely going to be different. On the workout yeah. side, you can talk about that. Yeah, uh, on, on our side, we're looking for a good, you know, again, it, they have some similarities, but they're definitely very different. We're looking for a stable shoe uh, in the gym uh, that provides some support for us, but also allows us to move like an athlete. Uh, you know, too much support can be negative as well. We, we've seen a bit of a trend with some of the basketball shoes that are out there causing some injuries because they're so, you know, they were higher up on the ankle. Um, so, you know, low profile, good stable shoe, 
Um, one thing that I will say real quick, this goes off top, well, similar topic to the shoes, but I'm actually going to have you take your shoes off. Uh, I would say, you know, we, I would encourage you to, next time you're doing a lunge or you're doing a squat or you, even you're hitting golf balls, take your shoes off, feel the ground with your feet, uh, barefoot, and, and get, you know, really pay attention to where you feel that weight distribution going. Are you in your toes all the time? Do you get to the outside of your feet? Um, so I know we're talking shoes in this particular question, but I would encourage you to give it a shot. Try some, try some things barefoot. That's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. And then just quickly on the golf side, so it, you want, again, that stable shoe, but uh, also some mobility. And you know, one thing you can look at, you know, go find somebody that you can get fit. Uh, look at the inboard. Some of them have an inboard that, that runs a full length of the shoe, so it's really stable, but it doesn't necessarily uh, move or articulate as your trail foot should move. So uh, you can look at, you know, how much you can twist the shoe uh, to see how you can articulate your trail foot. So you know, hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah. The next question is, how can I increase club head speed by using ground forces? Great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it really depends on understanding first where you are uh, for sure. Um, and not, not everybody's going to have the same amount of uh, horizontal, rotational, and vertical. Uh, some players use one more than the other. Uh, you know, for sure, you know, as Dr. Lynch talked about torque and, and rotational is, is a huge one and is one that is lacking a lot of times. Uh, if you don't have the proper stability and, and, and shoes and leveraging the ground. So, um, you know, I think it's a combination of just everything we're talking about here today from right shoes to, to just good quality movement. And, and I'd like to add to that too, is like, how do you move? You know, if you're moving, you know, do you have a leg dominance? I think it's really important to understand and, and identify that because that will help determine what force that may be your best force to use. Maybe it's not horizontal, maybe it's not torque, maybe it's vertical or vice versa. So just make sure you have that understanding of leg dominance as well um, and, and, and maybe work on that patterning. And our last question is uh, regarding the video earlier. Is it common to see high numbers in all three planes? Well, uh, good question. That, that is a good one. Um, you know, <laughs> Scotland uh, definitely has seen, seen more swings than anybody on this, but um, it, you know, I think there, he did show Justin Rose was a, a prime example of somebody who used all three really well, but I think for the most part what we've seen from him is at least the best players in the world, which is where most of the research has been done so far. We're working on getting more research on juniors for you, but um, you know, a lot of people just kind of utilize two more than, than all three is what we've seen. I would yeah. say in juniors what we're seeing most is uh, the vertical, uh, vertical forces being the dominant force in junior athletes. Um, you know, that's whether that's an instinctive way that, you know, young athletes who haven't created the level of stability yet want to move the club to generate the speed. Um, you know, as, as they grow, get stronger, uh, that those forces might, might start, start to change. But it's not a bad thing. Um, yeah. But we, we typically see the vertical forces being pretty dominant in sure. juniors for sure. Yep, for sure. That's all the questions we have, but we do have a pop quiz winner. All right, pop quiz winner. Who do we have? Today is Michael Brown. Michael oh, Brown. Brown. All right, Michael, Michael Brown. Brown. All Good right. Stuff. Thanks so much. Uh, again, let me just remind you, make sure you get on the Junior Golf Hub, get your uh, you know, self-assessment done, you know, get in there, uh, get your profile up, you know, get those coaches looking at your profile, seeing what you're doing. You know, if you have some questions or concerns, like we said, give us some feedback so maybe we can contact you through your uh, Junior Golf Hub profile. Uh, get a practice sheet up there for you. Maybe uh, you'll learn something more about yourself as you go through the self-assessment uh, and maybe come in and want to do a, a coach guided assessment, uh, some of the things that we do here uh, on a regular basis. So, again, thanks for watching. We want to always thank you uh, to our sponsors, Ethan Allen Preparatory, uh, Achieving Your Greatness in the Classroom, uh, on the golf course, and in life and the Junior Golf Hub. Again, download that app. Make sure you get those coaches in your pocket there. You know, find that right fit for you so to help you achieve your goals, uh, again, on and off the golf course. And as always, thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, look forward to you guys enjoying your journey as we're enjoying our journey. Uh, get after it.